Isn't it great that we've solved the traffic problem in Dade County? Huh? Um, who would have thought there's a heat game going on? Look, you know, when we started this book fair, one of the reasons for starting it was to bring life to downtown Miami. I think we succeeded a little too, too much. But um, my name is Mitch Kaplan. I want to welcome all of you on behalf of the Miami Book Fair and tell you just what kind of a thrilling week it's been so far. And you have an even more thrilling week as we go tonight into, the, into Sunday. Um, I can never stand up here. I know it sounds like a broken record, but I deserve, it's not. And that is that this college and Miami-Dade College is in a remarkable, uh, has given us a remarkable gift of this book fair. And I think we all need to give them a big, big round of applause. Everybody you see working here is uh, a staff member of the college and they just give of their time and they volunteer their time and effort to make this work. They're deans and they're professors and um, you know, I'm constantly amazed at what this, this college does. I was just talking to the dean of the Honors College here and uh, she was telling me about some of the schools that some of her students who just came to this country maybe two or three years ago went to college and next year they'll be going to Harvard and Yale and Stanford and other places. So what this college does, it just, it's kind of a beacon of hope for so many of us. Um, I also want to make a kind of uh, an announcement. Uh, if you're planning to come the rest of the week, make sure you go online for the most up-to-date schedules. I know we have a fairgoer's guide that's a print version, but at miamibookfair.com, you'll really, you know, there have been some changes in that schedule. A major change is that Kazir Khan was scheduled for 9.30 on Saturday, but he's coming in the afternoon instead of at 9.30. Um, and I knew the time he was coming until it just left my mind. It's at 5, at 5 o'clock on uh, Saturday. So please know that. Um, so we'll get started. And to introduce our guests, it's my pleasure to bring up someone very close to me and close to all of us in the South Florida community. He's probably one of the most literate people I know. I know that because I know what books he buys. And um, he also is one of the most uh, perceptive people that I've ever read about what goes on here in South Florida. He uh, started as a print journalist. Uh, many of you remember him from the Miami Herald. Uh, he then went on to become a reporter at uh, WPLG. Um, um, and now you know him uh, uh, for his remarkable Sunday morning program called This Week in South Florida, which is on at 11.30 on Sundays. And his name is Michael Putney. Please give him a big, big welcome. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Thanks to Mitchell. Thanks to Dr. Eduardo Padron and so many others who've made the book fair one of our great community events. I just, I've been coming here for what, 30 years, and it's my privilege tonight to briefly introduce two outstanding, smart, tough, politically sophisticated, and acerbic women <laughs> who are going to, yes, who have so much to say about our current political scene and what is to come. Let me begin by saying Anna Navarro, I've known Anna for many years. Uh, she is just about as acerbic as they come, smarter, you know, whip smart, uh, faster than a speeding bullet with a retort, a comeback, a put down. Uh, certainly saw that when that Access Hollywood tape uh, came out. Anna liked to quote it verbatim. I don't know the people at CNN and ABC loved it, but I loved it. She was born in Nicaragua, came to the U.S. at the age of eight, has lived here since then. In other words, she is a Miamian. And yes, our great diverse city. And uh, she is a registered Republican of the Jeb Bush, John McCain variety, I think. Um, 
Needless to say, Donna Brazil is a Democrat. She was born in New Orleans, raised there, uh, went to school in Louisiana. We got to know her in 2000 when she ran Al Gore's uh, campaign, which of course ended in our state. <laughs> as so many things do, began as well. Um, she was the Democratic National Committee interim uh, chair in, from July 2016 to February of 2017, succeeding Debbie Wasserman Schultz. And I think they probably will say something about why she succeeded Debbie. And if you want to see more, I interviewed Donna a few minutes ago. We're going to run that interview on Sunday morning. I loved it before the 2008 Democratic National Convention, uh, Donna told Stephen Colbert, quote, um, I like, um, look, I'm a woman, so I like Hillary. I'm black, so I like Obama. And I also am grumpy, so I like McCain. <laughs> I don't think she's in a grumpy mood. She's in a great mood. Aside from the one hour it took her to get here from her hotel on Brickell. So please welcome <laughs> two outstanding women, Donna Brazil and Ana Navarro. Circumstances, I think you should go on the right. This is my sister. Did y'all know that she has African descent? She's a descendant of slaves. I didn't need Skip Gates to tell me that she was a sister. I've known for a long time that she was a sister. This well. is my sister from another mother. <laughs> Hello, Miss Navarro. I'm in your home. Hello, girl. Welcome. It's good to see you. Bienvenida. Hey. I'm Miami. <laughs> Yo soy Donna. <laughs> all right. So, first of all, do you know this little book fair? This began as a little book fair 34 years ago. I am so proud of this college and so too. proud I of this book too. fair. Thank it you. is now. I mean, you know, I'm from Miami, so we like superlatives. I think it's the best damn literary event in the world. I agree with you. I agree. You know, the heat's playing tonight, right? But I, this is another kind of heat we're going to set off tonight. We're going to set up a heat wave. Heat wave. Let me tell you, in this book, you talk a lot about storms. And I don't know, but since you stepped foot in this town, it hasn't stopped raining. <laughs> Well, be careful because, you know, we're now, we passed Philippe. So the next storm is going to be an R, it's going to be Rashid, and that one. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Well, I don't know what it's going to take. Maybe we got to get down to Zelda or Zoe for somebody Thank to start believing in uh, exactly. climate change in the White House. I'm telling you. You know, we, we worry about that here in Miami because we're going to drown. I mean, we're the first ones to go. Look, I'm from New Orleans, and, you know, we have four good seasons, shrimp, crab, crawfish, and oysters. <laughs> So the last thing I want is another storm. Uh, How was your day, honey? Sweetheart, I've been a little frazzled, you know. I've been, uh, they put up a termite tent in my house this morning, so I thought that it was very fitting that after dealing with the bugs in Florida, we could talk about the bugs in Washington. Amen, amen. <laughs> a lot of bugging going on. I, you know, you need to get a little boric acid. I need to come over there and do a little Petamos catch melis for you. <laughs> I got no idea what she just said. <laughs> Cleaning is not my forte. So I just finished reading the book. Thank you. Took you forever to finally mail it to me. <laughs> you didn't even sign it for me. Well, I will sign it today. All right. I'm not even making a line. And, you know, the book made me a little sad. And the book made me a little sad because I lived a lot of this, right? Yes. As your friend, as yes, your you sister, yes. as a CNN colleague, yes. as a political activist, as an American. And the threat on democracy that the 2016 
elections have meant. I think it's something that when I, when I read about it in pages, it just makes me so sad because you go through a chronological order. But it also made me sad because I lived through this with you, a lot of it. The Seth Rich murder. You were with me. The um, death of your dog, who you adored. Love my booty whites. The loss of your job at CNN. Yes. Which was a family for you. Yes. The loss of the election. The um, loss of friends. Yes. And so I think this election has been hard for you. And I heard a lot of pain and a lot of grief in your voice in this, in this book. So how are you doing? <laughs> how are you doing now? You want me to dance? Oh, geez. <laughs> Stop. Last time you danced, you lost an election. Oh. <laughs> That's true. I did dance across that stage. I know. Because I thought I had it. I thought I could do the job. I thought that I was ready to do the job. I didn't want the job. I got the job because the party was hacked. And as a result of the hacking and the release of, the selective release of certain emails, I took the job. When Debbie stepped aside, I stepped back up. How am I feeling now? I'm still a little disappointed that people are not outraged by the fact that we had a foreign government interfere in our election. I lived it in real time. I saw it in real time. And yet a year ago, people called me, quote, unquote, crazy. They called me crazy again. I think you've gone crazy, but go ahead. OK. Yeah, next time, since you are my friend, next time I take a job that doesn't pay money, call me crazy. <laughs> I told you not to take it. You, you did. And I, I told you to you were a masochist. You did. Yeah, I told you to be thankless. And when I took this job, I had no idea the extent of the hacking. I knew that a few emails had been leaked. I knew that several donors had been compromised. I knew that many of our staff people were under attack and harassed. But I had no idea that it would impact not just my life personally, but our country. And so there was a moment, Anna, when I would call you, and I was like, I need Republicans. We cannot do this alone because our country was being attacked by a hostile foreign government. You know, it, it, it's, it's like somebody comes in and invades your house, they get into your house, and you say, well, did they come in through the window or, or, or through the door? But unlike Watergate, where they actually came through the door, this was a 21st century crime. It was a cyber crime. And no one at the DNC, because of the layers we had at the DNC, no one told the person at the top that things are not happening the right way. So by the time I became chair, it was already a mark. I wanted, you know, after I received my brief and I wanted to go to the Pentagon, I'm like, why am I going back to the DNC? They need yellow tape around it. We had suspicious packages. A few months before, somebody said that there was a snake. And then I started getting all of those crazy, quote unquote, threats. So how am I feeling now? I still want the American people to be outraged because we should never allow this to happen again. No one should interfere in our election. So we know John, John Podesta's, uh, res, what is it called, risotto? You see, risotto. We know his recipe. You know that I attempted to give. He makes it creamy. Yeah, you, you know that I attempted to give Hillary heads up and questions, but you didn't see the ones that I gave to Bernie, anybody else, because WikiLeaks didn't care if you saw those. They wanted you to see the Hillary ones. The narrative had to be that she was what? What Donald Trump was saying every night. I saw every night when Donald Trump would go out there and say, that Donna Brazil, now by the way, both Miss Navarro and myself, we're on the enemies list. Is he liking you? No, but he's liking you, he's worrying me. He liked me one day, <laughs> that is, that's not love. He's calling you now Donna B. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't know what the B stands for. <laughs> I can assure you there's nothing going on. <laughs> I don't know, boo. <laughs> Baby, he's not my type. <laughs> and you're not his. <laughs> but if I did compete in Miss USA, I would come up with the, the first place for the woman who did not wear the bikini. 
All right, but, you're, you know, you got a little bit ahead of schedule on me, but you brought ahead. it up. Go ahead. You, you talked about sending the emails. And it's incredible how much, how much 2016 on the Democratic side in particular was all about emails. The email server, the, you, you know, the emails with the questions to the debate. The emails in Huma Abedin, then uh, Wieners. Can you guys believe this thing could have, might have been decided by a sex scandal not involving Bill Clinton? <laughs> Anyways, I mean, it was all about emails. WikiLeaks emails, emails, emails. But you just talked about the emails you sent the Hillary campaign. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's clear this up because I'm confused. I was confused by the book. I've, I've been confused by some of your answers. Did you send emails? with debate questions to Hillary Clinton. I gave everybody a heads up. So you sent some to Bernie too. Let's, let's, let's go back two steps. There's one step you're missing, okay? And the reason why I quit CNN that night was that CNN wanted me to put out a statement that I thought was untrue. And I said, I, I don't want you to do that. I also said, don't, don't put my life at stake. Because at this point in the campaign, I recognized what people were doing with these emails and I said, don't threaten me. Unlike some people, I don't have secret service. I just have Jesus. And so, uh, which I told Michelle Obama once, and she looked at me, I said, yeah. <laughs> and so CNN wanted to say that I took questions from them. I said, oh, no. You, when you and I would go I, to the I, debates. I know you didn't take questions from CNN because it's impossible to get questions from CNN. I mean, I, you know, we, we know how this works. CNN, um, and I suspect, you know, other networks, but I know, you know, we know how CNN works. They established something that's called the cone of silence, a, a special room. Thank and you. none of us are allowed anywhere near it. Look. We're not know, even in the same hotel. We're not in the same we're hotel. We're in the Treasure me. Island, then the, the other one, the Ritz-Carlton. Right. So. We know because I go over so there. I mean, I, you, you got the questions, but you did not get them from CNN. First of all, can we just, re can we talk? Go ahead. If you read the questions, you will know that they never came from CNN. What CNN did get from me was a lot of debates because I was under pressure to get debates. But I was under another kind of pressure to expand the number of debates, town halls, and forums. I was also under pressure from Black Lives Matter and many of the activists to expand the quote unquote the diversity because we were. I love Anderson, I love Wolf, I love Jake, I love Dana, but mm, they don't look like me or you, right? Right. And so the pressure I was under as the vice chair of the party, and that is a CNN commentator, I was under another kind of pressure with CNN. The pressure I was under was to produce diversity as well as additional questions and topics that had not been addressed. And so when we expanded the number of debates in town halls and other forums, the bulk of which went to CNN, thank you very much. Somebody said thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I love CNN. I still love CNN. I still watch you. <laughs> um, but when we expanded and we were about to start talking about criminal justice reform, death penalty, this is my favorite one, the Flint water crisis in Flint. I had been working with Roland Martin, who had been working with a bunch of other people. We decided, rather than go to another quote-unquote stale debate where we talk about what? The horse race and the emails. Roland and I had worked together. And we had come up with a lot of questions. And yes, I gave all of the candidates heads up. And I also said in the book that I used to give Republicans heads up when I would be on the panel with them and said, guess what? Here are the topics. I've always given people heads up. I didn't take nothing. I shared something. So you say in this book, sending those emails was a mistake. Yes, I did. I will forever regret. Absolutely. And you know why? Because if you're going to have your email sent and people only see the ones that you gave to this one, but not the other one. But when I went back to look for the other debate questions and all that other stuff I had done, guess what? My files had been wiped clean. So I couldn't defend myself. Well, so I took the hit. I took all of the hits. I, I got to tell you, for me, for me it's, been, it's been difficult and it's been painful. Yeah, uh, no. As you know, I love you're you my and you're my sister. Um, you know, I, I stood up for you and I defended you. You did. But at the same time, I, I very much understand the need that CNN has and the, the 
duty they have to defend the their network. journalistic integrity and their, their brand. And, uh, you know, you need, particularly in the face of such attacks right now about fake news and the media and all of these attacks. And the questions didn't come from CNN. CNN's process wasn't Pierce. It's just, you know, they sent Donna Brazil to go give water out in Flint, Michigan as a PR thing. And Donna Brazil will talk to potted plants. And one of the p people she gave water to was asking one of the questions later that night. Well, you don't send Donna out to uh, talk to people who may be asking questions because she will get you to confess every sin you've committed in your life <laughs> and the ones that are yet to be committed. So, you know, bottom line, CNN's, CNN's process was not pierced. You regret having sent the emails. So can we all just be friends? Can I say something to you? I have not, I've, I've really, uh, I've found, I have found these exchanges painful. I, of all of the things that, I, and I said this in the book, I regretted this because I couldn't, I couldn't, I'm Catholic, ladies and gentlemen. And she's and, real Catholic. And I am. I'm a, you know. I, I'm, I, <laughs> You know, I, and I, I, I also have probably thick skin. And if I do something bad, I will do penance. Because that's the only way to get back to grace. And I apologize. The first thing I did when I could not find my emails, because they were the DMC emails that were hacked and stolen, I called Bernie Sanders and I said, I need, I need help. I said, and you know what? Bernie staffers went out and defended me on television when I was getting just beat up, and they knew I was fair. The one thing I will always tell you, I'll be fair with you. Now, I'm, I'm gonna I'm a still try to fight you, but I'm a, I'm a fair fighter. Uh, but it made me sad that no one went out there and said, the Hillary campaign, here's the dilemma I'm in, and then we're gonna get on, on to some other juicy topics. Here's the dilemma I'm in. The Hillary campaign is John Podesta's emails, not Donna Brazile's emails. My emails, I have seven accounts. I have six now. My one account I don't have anymore is my DNC account, okay? And the Hillary Clinton campaign, John Podesta didn't go out and verify that these were his emails. Has John Podesta gone out yet and even said that, that is my risotto re recipe? No, he's not verified any of the WikiLeaks dump. The only person, the only person in America that is verifying the had stolen emails from WikiLeaks that we now know that Donald Trump Jr. was orchestrating. The only person who's verifying that is me. Now, it's okay, I'm a big girl. I take my hits, I take, because I give it out, I dish too. But all I want us to learn from the hacking of 2016 is that we can no longer as a country believe that our elections are secured from cyber attacks. If we learn anything from reading my 260 page book, it is that you can no longer get a thumb drive at a convention and go stick it in your computer. You can no longer go around with your quote unquote, your password being your home address or your last name. If you don't have two- Or password. Remember? Right. A password. So password, or, or, a password. A password. Right. A one, two, three, four. Right. Okay? If my book tells you anything, is that we have to take prudent steps to secure our democracy, to ensure that this doesn't happen again. Look, if, if somebody offers you rubles to place ads, <laughs> and if you, and this is what, and Anna, I call her my sister because during some of the worst days, she would call me late at night, you home? When I didn't get a call from a lot of people, she would call me and said, let me take you to lunch. Sometime when you lose elections, people lose your name. They don't know you anymore until they can call you again when they're running again. They don't worry if your bills are being paid if you're able to get back up, they move on. They go back to their, their wonderful lives. And you know who stuck around to make sure all of the kids were okay? 
Me. You know who made sure the kids still had health insurance? Me. You, knew, you know who had to keep raising money? Me. And you know who made sure I was being taken care of? This woman. That's why she's my friend. That's why she's in my book. Well, you know, and I'm going to let her sign my book. <laughs> I, uh, I think too often nowadays we are defining relationships and friendships be it in the workplace, family, marriages, friendships, by politics. And that really just strikes me as such a dumb thing to do. True. You know, th this will pass, folks. This will pass. And to lose a real friendship, because somebody may have voted for somebody different than you did, you know, I'm not sure that then you can define that as a real <laughs> friendship. So talking about friendships, <laughs> I'm looking, I, you know, this book has, was this book hard to write? You, you know, you, I'm, I'm looking at page 42. And man, you go after some friends. You said <laughs> he, Obama, had left the DNC in debt. Hillary bailed it out so she could control it. And Debbie Wasserman Schultz went along with all of this because she liked the power and perks of being chair, but not the responsibilities. Woo! Girl, anybody? So how are your friendships with the Clintons and the Obamas these days? <laughs> I don't answer to anyone but God. Right. But more importantly, in politics, I answer to you, the voter, and you, the donor. This, this has never been about a candidate or a campaign. It's about our democracy and our people. I started at the age of nine because I wanted a playground. And while the city council candidate who promised a playground kept his promise, to me, it was all about getting people active, engaged, and involved in the political process. When you walk out of a building and you leave it with $23.5 million in debt, you ought to be ashamed of yourself if the person who walks behind you into the room find out that people are getting paid $25,000 a month and they don't even come in the office. I am driving my car with my gas. I am flying to Florida and everywhere else with my nickels, my dimes, and they're getting 25 grand a month. You think I'm going to just sit there and say, Madam Chair, do you want to drive a Hell no. I don't even like Uber. And you know I will never have one of them cars that don't have nobody behind it. <laughs> Hell no. You know a Louisiana person, you know, we, we like to control the wheel. You know? <laughs> and then the <clears throat> next thing, Madam Chair, do you need a consultant? No, we broke. <laughs> Madam Chair. And I'm like, cut that Madam Chair stuff. I'm Donna. And no, I just, I want to win. But I got to get the debt down. So I went to all of our, some of our friends. And I said, I need you to take 10000 a month, not fifteen, not twenty-five, not thirty. dollars Ooh, I made a lot of enemies. I'm, come on. I'm reporting to you, the voter, you, the donor, you, the American people. I'm not reporting to a bunch of consultants. They're all my friends, and they're living off the gravy train. And they did not like the, that I called it gravy train. Have, it was a gravy have you heard train. from uh, from no. Hillary? Bill? No. Barack? Did they call me before? Michelle? They call me when the party's in trouble. I'm the daughter of the maid and the daughter of the Jan that goes in and clean up behind everybody. Come on, man. Obama, Come on, sister. Obama invited you to every one of his birthday parties. And I, I love remember him. the time you threw out your knee dancing. It still hurts, too. <laughs> She was dancing with them. I love all the, Look, I love them all. If I had to do it all over again, I would do it because I love them. So why did you write this book? Because, what, nobody, what no, because no one wanted to tell the true story, the autopsy of what happened in 2016. And do you think I was going to wait until Director Mueller or the Congressional Committee to tell you that we were hacked and that they were stealing our data? Do you think I was going to wait and, until the American people woke up? and figured it out. No, I had a story to tell because I lived it. I lived the hacking of 2016. I experienced how they tried to discredit our election, destroy our democracy, and hurt our nominee. And I wanted to tell it. Robin Muth could write his book. Hillary can write her book. Donna's going to write her book. And can I tell you something? 
This is my second book. I've written chapters. I wrote columns every week. When you lose the electoral college, um, but you win the popular vote, I go to Harvard. So I study a lot. So I've been, I studied. I kept all of my notes. I have my calendar. I have all of the records. I have everything. I even have a, a text message where I, email, I texted Mark Elias saying, is MI6 on our payroll? Need to know. He called me and said, you don't need to know. OK. Three weeks ago, everybody said, well, why, did, why didn't you know? But I did ask. And they told me I needed to know because I didn't control my money. Had I taken control of my money, I would have blown up the process. And so I just kept my mouth shut and seethed, feeling every moment like Patsy the Slave being whipped, <laughs> being told I couldn't spend money. I asked them for, and I'm a conservative, by the way. I may not look like one, but I'm very conservative. She, she, she owns guns. <laughs> and she shoots them. Would you? I'm from Louisiana. She shoots it. My mother used to tell us, when you go to the zoo, don't focus on the species. Think about the recipe. <laughs> leave, leave it at that. Don't get into my business. Oh, I pity, I pity the animal that tries to eat her shrubs. They, they're not coming by my house no more. <laughs> OK. <laughs> but now, why are you getting me off topic? I got no idea. Where the hell were we? <laughs> this is why we, we used to be on CNN, and they would try to talk about serious stuff. And she and I were like, you know what? This is not serious. And we had our own conversation on air, live before the American people. And when we left, we would go over to the bar and order something nice. Can we sit in front of this on? A little, little wine. And we'd eat dozens of oysters and laugh. People would walk by and say, I thought y'all should be arguing. No, we're not going to argue over this. Uh-uh. Life is too important. And really, life is too short to define people by political affiliation. Define people by values. Define people by shared experiences. Define people by accomplishments. Define people by successes and defeats and how they get around them. Don't define people by politics. We've lost the ability in America to embrace diversity of thought, to be with people that think differently, that look differently, that talk differently, that have a different accent than we do. And I think that that, that kind of polarization is one of our biggest problems. Look, Donna and I think differently on a lot of issues. Oh, God. A lot of issues. Ooh. But that doesn't mean you can't have a friendship. That doesn't mean you don't share things in common and that you love America and want to see the best in your country. I was talking about the $8 million. <laughs> I agree with that. What $8 million? Oh, the $8 million. So as Which Karen, you ended up getting two. And they gave me two, mil, two million for 10 weeks. And so this is the night that I knew I was upset with the world. The night when Donald Trump on August 19th, see, I still remember this. This is why I had to write the book while I was fresh. And he said, what the hell do you have to lose? And I'm sitting in my office at the DNC. And by the way, I didn't never sit in the chair's office. I made the chair's office like the, like the conference room for people, important people who came in. I sat in the side office. And when he said, what the hell you have to lose, you know, I started saying, Obamacare, climate change, gay rights, civil rights, voting rights. I just kept, and I'm screaming. I start writing a column, and then I'm ready to do an ad, because I got a good ad to respond to what the hell you have to lose, right? And you got no money. Guess what? They said, don't worry, Madam Chair. I said, Donald Trump is talking to people that I know. We got to respond. We got to tell them what to sit, tell them back. All I could do was write a column for USA Today because I had no money. Because the money that I was raising wasn't under my control. And this is the best part. Even when I wrote a press release, now, mind you, I was a syndicated newspaper columnist. I wrote every week. And mind you, <laughs> They looked at me, and they used to have to approve my press releases. And I'm saying, whoa, I've been a press secretary. I've been a communications director, a syndicated newspaper columnist. I write for O Magazine, Ms. Magazine, S. You got a pr some person, half my agent, approving my columns? You ain't got enough salt in your to proof my column. <laughs> but you know what? I went along to get along, and I just kept tabs. I would have written this book had she won the Electoral College and the popular vote. 
Because the American people need to understand. Girl, you would have gotten deported. And I would have climbed that wall and came right back home. <laughs> the big, beautiful wall. <laughs> With a big, beautiful door. <laughs> big, beautiful wall. That Mexico's going to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, so you talk about go ahead. calling Bernie, telling him. And in the entire, you know, you talk about going in there and trying to figure out if the DNC had been rigged for Hillary. At some point, you call him up. You find this, this document. You call up Bernie Sanders and you tell him, I found the cancer, but I'm not going to kill the patient. So I guess the basic question is, was the DNC primary process, was the process rigged for Hillary, and if so, how? You can't rig, I mean, let me, this is somebody who knows the rules. When I served as campaign manager for Al Gore, I stepped aside as the co-chair of the Rules and Bylaws Committee. You always want to, you know, at least appear to be fair. I stepped aside because I wanted Bill Bradley to have a, fi a fair fight, although I was for Al Gore. And by the way, that was the last time I actually supported somebody in the primary. I don't, I don't get involved in presidential primaries anymore. Al Gore was it. So I tend to watch from the sideline, but I am on the Rules Committee. And as a member of the Rules Committee, our, our rules, our process was not rigged. But what I wanted to do was to go in there and to determine if the money that was being spent before the primary had ended if any of that money tainted the process. And what I found disappointed me. Uh, and it was unacceptable because it was unacceptable even for me to do my job as chair. So in exchange for bailing us out, in which I applaud Hillary Clinton for bailing us out, she put us on a starvation diet, which was fine. But I, I owed it to Bernie because I promised Bernie that I would get to the bottom of it, and I did that. Senator Sanders and I go back to the Jackson campaign in 1984, he was an outsider. He's anti-establishment. I was outside anti-establishment. I guess I'm now establishment, but outside of back again. I got kicked out the door. It's all right. It's always good when you get kicked out, because you can come back in through the window. <laughs> That's if I choose to come back in. I might start a dance party, in which case I might actually be one of my partners. That's OK. We can dance all night long. She can dance, but her knees are so bad. They are so bad. That's what they have ice for. But, <laughs> I, wanted, but I, wanted, I wanted Bernie and his supporters, because I wanted them to be a part of what was going to happen. Hillary won the primary fair and square. She had 4 million more votes than Bernie. She did not set the primary date in Florida or Alabama, or my beloved Louisiana. She also had more pledged delegates and more unpledged delegates. Now, I don't know if you read today that Tim Kaine called for the elimination of unpledged delegates. So we, we need to have these debates within the party. We need to have this conversation. If not now, when? So what are some of the specific reforms you'd like to see at the DNC? Well, the Unity Commission is going to take on a lot of the so-called electoral confirms, the pledged versus unpledged delegates. They're also going to take a look at the window, what states go before Iowa, New Hampshire. Once upon a time, most of you people in Florida hated me because we penalized you for going early. <laughs> 2008. I know, I just want to make sure you all know that I'm the same Donna. I cause trouble all the time. Um, I also think that, you know, internally the party is making, Tom Perez is doing a great job in reforming the party. That's why we had so many great victories last week across the country. First, let's start by, let's be honest. Howard Dean was absolutely right. We got to have a 50 state strategy. I love you, Florida. I love all 29 of your electoral votes. But there's no reason why from Florida all the way across to New Mexico, there's no other state on this side of the, the, the line that gets resources. Virginia gets a few dollars. North Carolina gets a few dollars. But again, look across this vast country, especially in the south, no other state. And so we've missed opportunities over the last 10 years to field Democratic candidates in all of these states. And on Tuesday, Tom, Tom Perez invested in down-ballot races. That enabled us to have victory after victory after victory. And by the way, we're now 450 votes short of winning three more seats in Virginia. So it's important that we invest down-ballot, that we put resources across the country, that we adopt Howard Dean's prescription which is all 50 states matter. Should because, the DNC get rid of superdelegates? You know, as somebody who's been a superdelegate now for 20 years, uh, 
Can I just say no comment? <laughs> uh, I think we need to have a healthy debate about it. And I think the reason why we should have a healthy debate, and I'll say this and people, I don't want voters to think that my vote matters more than their vote. And as long as you have that perception that I am somehow or another special, super, that I got power, um, I don't want that. So with that in mind, I can understand that people like me in the future, if I want to be the delegate to the convention, I need to run. Now, I don't know, as a former chair, a chair twice, chair emeritus, I still may have special status, but I don't know. Don't take away all my love. <laughs> so there's a point in the book where you say, why wasn't Obama saying something? You're talking about the intelligence. Where were the intelligence agencies? This was a national emergency. Actually, that's a point that I've heard a lot of Republicans make. Why wasn't, if this was all happening, why wasn't President Obama talking about it? Why wasn't he? My understanding is that President Obama went to the leadership in Congress, Republicans and Democrats, and they said, and Mitch McConnell said, you should not make a big deal out of this. You should not go public. And so the president decided, because he told the president that it would tip the scales. Um, I know that uh, Leader Pelosi went to uh, Paul Ryan, and Paul Ryan ignored her. I know that uh, Chairman Lujan went to his counterpart at the uh, National Republican Congressional Committee. He was ignored. And on October 18th, after our briefing with DHS, I went to Rince Priebus. I went to Rince Priebus on October 4th, which was the Republican vice presidential, I mean, the vice presidential debate in um, Virginia. And he looked at me. There's a picture on Getty Photos. He looked at me because I was all in him. I said, you know this is happening. And th this is another revelation. He always looks that way. Oh, maybe that's, be well, don't start. <laughs> uh, this is another revelation in the book. I tried to reach out to Sean Spicer, not, this, not to Melissa McCarthy, Sean Spicer. <laughs> but I tried to reach out to Sean Spicer throughout the entire time we were being hacked. First. I wanted him to know what was in the, the hacking. Secondly, I wanted him to know about the spyware and the malware just in case he opened it. What worried me as an American is that if the DNC went down, we would corrupt the election systems across the country. And I wanted to make sure the Republican system was protected because we have two major political parties and we have databases of all of the American voters. And I was worried. And you know, every time I went out to the Republicans, you, and people call me angry, bitter. Yeah, I am a little bit, a little upset that the Republicans ignored it. And the reason why Obama didn't use the bullet pulpit more the way you saw Angela Merkel use it in, in uh, Germany this year is because he was told that you would tip the scale. I also think there's one other reason. And that is because the Hillary Clinton campaign, they were convinced they would win. They were so convinced that they would win that I don't think they even polled in the last three weeks. They were going to a public poll and they said, she's going to win. And meanwhile, here I'm putting cold water on their little, uh, <clears throat> not so fast. I mean, who else would know about, you know, how polls can, I mean, um, on the day of the election, I mentioned that I walk into the ballroom and they're all sitting there feeling out like what position they're going to have in the administration and the presidential novel, and I'm sitting there like, do you know the people in Durham, the, the, the polls are not open because the machines are not working because there's no electricity? And they looked at me like, I said, you know there's a long line in Philadelphia because people, and they looked at me like, and it wasn't until like seven o'clock that night that they started like, <gasps> and I'm like, really? And I was so angry at this point. I went over to the so-called victory party, and the first person I ran into was Stevie Wonder. I know Stevie Wonder because I worked with him on the campaign to make King's birthday a national holiday. And so I say, Stevie, what are you doing here? Well, it was a victory party. I said, people are, people are not turning out in Detroit. You should be on the radio like me. I was panicking. And they were not panicking. They thought they were going to win. All day they kept saying to me when I was sending them, Madam Chair, haven't you seen the exit polls? I don't believe exit polls. Remember Florida? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do have a history with y'all. I should buy a house here and try to make it up. Just make up. <laughs> yeah, but I bet, I bet you right now you miss George W. Bush. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, let's, I want to talk about something that um, I know is very close to your heart, very significant for you. 
I was, you and I were giving a speech together in the West Coast the day you found out Seth Rich had been murdered. You knew this young man. I remember you crying and crying and crying that day and just how heartbroken, paralyzed you were. Donna, tell us about Seth. Why? His heart. He, he was one of my kids. I have so many children. I've never given physical birth. I've given political birth. Seth could have worked in any department in the DNC. He was so bright, so smart, so ambitious. And my department is the least glorious. We do voter protection. I created the Voting Rights Institute after the election of 2000. And often it's hard to recruit people to come and work in that department because it's, it's hard work. And Seth came with so much enthusiasm. And he wanted to help us build out this platform of I will vote, I will vote. Seth had succeeded beyond our imagination in creating this platform for the party. And so when I received that call, it devastated me because he was my child. His parents, Joel and Mary, are great people. I've been to their home. I've visited their synagogue. I've spoken at a service in honor of Seth to raise money for a summer camp program. He was a patriot. He was an honorable, decent human being who was murdered in Washington, D.C. It pains me to see so many lies out there, lies that really come from places that I've never I would never go. Lies that said that Seth corrupted our system. That's not true. He had no access to our system. Lies that said that Seth was the one that was leaking emails. Seth had no administrative controls. He wasn't even on the same floor. And so I can tell you this on behalf of all of the staff, all of his former colleagues, all of us. We loved him. He was our friend, a great, honorable young man. And I hope we bring the person or the individuals who murdered him to justice. But he's my child. Anybody who knows anything about my children know that I will go out there and fight for you. But last weekend, before we had that tremendous victory across the country, there were people criticizing me for the time in my book. And I laughed. Because the weekend before that, no one criticized me from flying from Boston to D.C. where I was canvassing in Northern Virginia. Nobody criticized me three weeks ago when I was raising money for the DNC, the DCCC, and for the Virginia Democratic Party. No one has ever criticized me for all of the voter registration I've done and all of the campaigns. Nobody's going to criticize me for going to Alabama in a couple of weeks. But yet they, had, they were upset that I could put pen to paper and say, this is what happened based on the views and the experience of the former chair. And so that Sunday I said something that I do have regrets. Every now and then I do regret. I told him to go to hell. <laughs> and I have to tell y'all something. No, no, no. They're my friends, and God knows I'll fight for them. But I'll fight for my country. That was my daddy speaking. That was Lionel. <laughs> that was my daddy. And my daddy would tell you to go to hell. He would actually tell you to go do something else, too. And my mother would have said, Donna, you get more with honey than vinegar. I should have channeled Michelle Obama and said, when they go low, we go high. And so I've been trying to go high in the last couple of days. High because my, the, the, my motivation to write this was to make sure that we're never attacked again, that we find out the honest to God truth of what happened in 2016, and that we never face an election cycle again when the person who's elected is elected with the help by a hostile foreign government. I wish Donald Trump all the best in the world because he's my president. I know you're not going to agree with that. I pray no, for I Donald agree. Trump. He's your president. <laughs> <laughs> he's our president. I pray for Donald Trump. And the only way I've been able to get rid of some of the anger is by praying for him. Dr. King reminded us that he said, don't let no man bring you so low as to hate him. And I, I, I did a lot of 
therapy. I was diagnosed with PTSD, and I'm like, what the hell is that? <laughs> and grinding my teeth, my nerves, and just, I was rattled. And writing allowed me to, I felt like when I was writing my book, I was talking to the next generation. I want to teach them what I know. I want them to be aware of politics and campaigns. And if I just impress one kid or one millennial to get involved and do what Donna Brazile has done since the age of nine, then I would succeed. And if I upset my friends and they don't invite me for Thanksgiving meals or whatever, don't give me nothing for Christmas, my birthday is coming up, <laughs> I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to pray for them the same way when I came to Florida four days after the election. And Mary Matlin was with me. She's my other Republican friend. I got about five. <laughs> it's true. And they're all good friends. These are friends for life. And Mary and I were together. And Mary looked at me and she said, how are you holding on? I said, I'm reading Esther in the Bible. And then I'm studying Harriet Tubman. I needed Esther for my faith. I wanted my faith to be restored. And I read Harriet Tubman for courage. And I thank God that my prayers were answered. My faith has been restored, and my courage, well, let me just tell you, I'm my daddy's girl after all. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I don't get into a fight with Donna. <laughs> But man, this woman's got God on her side. She can pray him into a slather. I, uh, I, I remember when we went to see the Pope together, when he came to, uh, to the United States. Oh, gosh, she was my date. And, I'm trying uh, to bring a sinner to see the Pope, and I'm a sinner, too. <laughs> and, uh, Two sinning women. We had to get something to drink and eat before we went over, remember? Oh, I told you we at had to eat. At 6 o'clock. Yeah, at 5 in the morning, we, yeah. were, we were eating. And she had, she had a bag like the one Mary Poppins had in the movie. It, it was full of medals and stamps and saints and rosaries. I thought to my, that day I said, I'm never messing with this woman. I wanted them to be blessed. So we're going to take some questions from the audience, but I want to ask um, a couple of last questions. One is this sexual harassment, this mm. watershed moment we're living. How has it changed? You've been in politics. You've been working in male-dominated fields for 40 years. How has it changed, and why has it changed? I I'm glad. First of all, I wish it would have came to light 40 years ago. Oh, my God. You know what it was like to get in a room with a bunch of guys? I mean, the sexist jokes, the conversations you've had to endure, and... I'll never forget, there was one guy, I won't mention his name, but boy, 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 I used to threaten him. I said, if you touch one more child, I'm going to whip your what? <laughs> I took this boy downstairs from the campaign office and put him against, pushed him like that. I used to be strong when I was younger. And I said, if I hear from one more staffer that you are touching her inappropriately or suggesting anything, I'm going to throw you off the bus, campaign bus. I've had to protect so many young staffers. I've, I've had my moments, too, but everybody knew that don't touch nothing you didn't. Because I never believed in the casting couch. And I used to tell young girls and young women in campaigns, you don't have to get on the couch. That was a metaphor. You don't have to sleep with nobody to get pulled to the top. I'm going to pull you. So you tell them to go to hell. So I'm glad it's changing. I'm glad we're talking about it. Me too. But we need a zero tolerance, ladies and gentlemen. No one should be treated with disrespect. And you and I both know people in powerful positions. That's why when I was chair, I made it clear to my staff I said, I am your friend. I kept my door open. We don't play favoritisms when Donna's in charge. Anybody who wants to work hard, 
and fight to the last day, you are welcome to sit at the table. And you don't get promoted because of who you know and what you know. You get promoted because of what you do. What you do out there to lift people up and to get people involved. But I'm glad we're having this conversation. What worries me is today the president had an opportunity and he decided not to talk. He should talk about, he should talk he about, should. Mm -hmm. he should do it because he has a daughter and he has granddaughters. He should talk about it, but he, he's afraid and I'm disappointed in him. He should also talk about it, and we're, of course, referring to Roy Moore, because in Alabama, he could actually make a difference. You're damn right. And, uh, you know, it would be incredibly shameful for the country, for the Republican Party, for the U.S. Senate, if a child predator was able to get in there. Now, now, now we, we got to have our one minute. Girl, he was banned from the mall. I mean, I mean, he was banned from the mall. I mean, how are you going to get banned wait, from the did mall? You, wait, 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 forget, forget banned from the mall. Did you see that man signing that girl's yearbook? Yes. That was creepy. Creepy, creepy, creepy. I mean, Ooh, and wait. put his address, and then he signed it DA, district attorney, <laughs> to a graduating girl. Yeah, yeah no, no, and no. they knew when he came around what he was at. Oh, my God. But seriously, Please. I believe the women. Hashtag, I believe the women. Hashtag. And it should not be political. No. It, you know, when we talk about Harvey Weinstein, it shouldn't be, this is a Democrat problem. When we talk about Roy Moore, it shouldn't be, this is a Republican problem. Or Kevin problem. Spacey. This, and by the way. That's a, that's, a, that's a problem, period. Okay. And I've been on House of Cards twice. You're I'm not all, his type. I've all. <laughs> you know, this is why I miss her. She will always like let me know. But you know what? You're right. We need to have a zero tolerance. But people, fellow citizens, we have to speak up. This is serious. This is about power. And this we, is about abuse of power. And we need to. Educate our young boys, our young girls, but we need to, as a country and a society, understand that sexual assault is unacceptable. Zero tolerance. Sexual harassment. The students on campus, I teach this, you know, at Georgetown, and I preach it at Harvard. Zero tolerance. And you know what I did a couple of days ago? I went in the bathroom stalls, women's bathrooms, and I put, hear what you shouldn't know. Mm -hmm. You know, I go to stalls at night and put posters up. <laughs> I still cause trouble. And it, uh, Good trouble. And it's been, it's been disappointing to me that people who, because of politics, people who were so quick to believe the women in the yeah. Harvey Weinstein case are now quoting the Bible and not believing the women in the Roy Moore case. This is not Republican versus Democrat. This is not establishment versus base. This is morality. This is decency. This is basic right and wrong. I've read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I've read it on multiple she occasions. Did. I can quote it. Uh, you know, I wanted to be a priest when I was a little girl. My mother put me out of my misery. She said, you a girl. I said, what does that mean? <laughs> oh, Lord. I go to church now because I say, bless me, Father, I've sinned. I, what about you? Um, <laughs> I'm standing Catholic because it's going to turn. It's going to turn. I'm just waiting. <laughs> waiting. I'm, I'm, staying, the you know, I'm staying Catholic because everything else is just too hard. <laughs> and besides, I mean, what, are, what are the choices? Right. You know, Mormonism? You know what it is? G giving up cussing, caffeine, and liquor? Hell no. Me? No, I can't do that. That's, but no. what was Jesus' first miracle? He turned water into wine. And look, he listened to his mother, and he got the party started. That's why I love the Lord. All right, love my the last Lord. question before we get some questions. Love the Lord. From the audience. Well, you have, you've burned some bridges with this, with this book. Um, what is the next chapter for Donna Brazil? I am very excited to go back to what I enjoy the most. This year, when I was really, especially after the death of my dog, you know, I don't know about y'all, but 
I had animals growing up, and you know, we had Lucky because he was lucky to have us. We had Shaft because he was bad. But you know, my first adult dog was Chippity Chippity Gumdrop after the Gore campaign. And Chip has gone through so much with me. He went through Katrina. He's gone through, you know, our little earthquake in DC. And my little boy, my little boy died. And I never cried that hard in my life. And when I was at this moment in my life where I thought I would be back home with my dog, he dies. And I started thinking about my life. And I'm 57. I was out of commission for a couple of weeks. And I said, God, I know what I want to do. I want to go back to teaching. Because throughout my entire time when I was chair of the party, I kept my schedule. Just like when I became Al Gore's campaign manager, I took Southwest back and forth from Nashville to D.C. I love teaching. That's why I'm at Harvard. That's why uh, I'm engaged. I've lectured at over 200 and five college campuses. Uh, I've given commencement speeches. I'm going back to teaching. And it pays the least amount of money, but I got the greatest amount of joy. And you can come, because she's filled in for me a, a couple times on campus. So I'm going back to what I do best. I'm going back to teach. All right, where's Nick? We've got questions from the audience. I've got some questions. Ooh. But I think you Can guys I see him in advance? <laughs> <laughs> True to farm. Share. I, I, I was going to try to slip them to you through well, the back. Well, you could, but, baby. Um, I'm an open book. <laughs> I know, I know. And you guys covered so much of what was asked. But I thank the audience for putting forth some really good questions. Thank and you. I thought the first one we'd start, there's a young person in the audience who actually asked a question of both of you. And she says, how can I, with no political experience, contribute and get into politics? because I admire both of you women for being so powerful and so vocal. So what would you, what kind of advice would you give to a young woman who wants to get involved politically? Well, look, first I think you need to be informed and you need to be engaged. There's a thousand ways of doing it. You show up at town halls, you write letters to the editor, you get on social media. Anybody can get a hashtag going any, right now. Social media has got very bad things about it, it's also got very good things about it. It gives all sorts of people platforms. Volunteer. Both of us started licking envelopes and picking up phone calls and making phone calls. Volunteer and start learning the process and start growing. Network. Make friends. And just get, you know, is it Michael? That's your tagline. Stay informed and get involved. And watch Michael Putney. 11.30 a.m. Right. And, and Three words, answer the call. I mean, I tell my young students, I say, you know what? Each and every one of you were born for a purpose. And I go back to Esther, for such a time as this, we need you more than we, this generation, we need you now. We need you on the battlefield. We need your ideas. We need your energy. We need your wisdom. We need you. Answer the call. You know what else is very important is knowing who you are and what is important to you. Knowing your principles and your convictions and what you stand for so that then you know who you should support or you can support or you can live with supporting. It yeah. really should be less about labels right now and much more about principle. Amen. This is, this is for Donna. Donna. Talk a bit about um, your political influences and those you admire the most today. And it, I, I guess uh, the, the, the basis of this question is, how did Donna Brazil become Donna Brazil, ah. in essence? Uh, the third of nine kids who got involved right after Dr. King was assassinated. I'm, I'm probably one of the luckiest kids alive. I got a chance to meet Dr. King's widow, work with her. She inspired me. I got a chance to work with somebody who worked in the Roosevelt administration, Dorothy Height. I got a chance to, to know Barbara Jordan, Shirley Chisholm, work with Jesse Jackson, Bell Abzug. I can go on and on. But the, the people who inspire me today are the people who are still out there on the front lines creating change. The, not just the lawmakers, the people that you see on television, but the, the, the people out in the streets, Reverend William Barber, 
who is trying to reignite the poor people's campaign. I am always looking for leadership. I'm looking for people who are trying to make a difference. And so I'm always inspired by those who are serving and those who are willing to make the sacrifice. Thank you. Um, and to pick up on what you said before, here's a question. Uh, do you feel that, uh, that President Trump has generated a new coalition? People like the two of you sitting up here today, Brazil and Navarro, Charlie Sykes being interviewed by Lawrence O'Donnell and being on his show. You see George Will on Rachel Maddow, um, et cetera, and et cetera. What might this mean politically for the future, post-President Trump? You know, and you can disagree with me on this one. I, I'm very disappointed in Donald Trump. <laughs> Look, I, I didn't support Ronald Reagan, but the day, in which, the day that I saw him sign Dr. King's birthday into a national holiday, I said he was open to people who disagreed with him. When I saw George Herbert Walker Bush sign the Civil Rights Act, the renewal of the Civil Rights Act, of 64, I said he was open to people who disagreed with him. When I saw George Herbert Walker, I mean George Walker Bush, uh, do so much, including signing the renewal of the Voting Rights Act, I said he was open to people who disagreed with him. This president <laughs> is closed. He's closed to listening to people who can make a difference. I think my final straw, I thought Charlottesville was gonna be my last straw with him. You know how you give a man a chance? A second chance? I know you women in there know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been giving him so many chances to redeem himself. And then, you know, and then when he called Miss Maisha Johnson, I said, that's it. I'm done with him. I'll still pray for him, but I'm done with him. He has no manners. When he disrespected John McCain, disrespected the disabled, called Mexican rapists, I keep waiting for this man to come back and redeem himself. We all say, I'm sorry, God. I need forgiveness, God. Humble yourself. Humble yourself to the American people. It's you the people, not him the president. He won't humble himself. I disagree with him. I'm done with him. Well, I'll tell you what I think Donald Trump has done. Um, I think he's got America woke. America is awake in a way that we had not been before this. I think that Americans learned a year ago the difference that voting makes. I think that Americans have learned in the last year not to take democracy for granted, the rights and the duties and the privileges that come with it. Look, I think we've gotten a little complacent, a little comfortable. It was easy. Here in, the, in Florida, we absentee vote. We, you know, we don't show up. And even as easy as it is to vote, most of us, most Floridians don't. And so, you know, I think you have seen things this year like like the Women's March. You know, the person that was asking about somebody that's got no political experience and no power, this was a homemaker, this was a mom in Hawaii who went online the day after the election, that election night, and said, the day after the inaugural, I'm gonna go to Washington and I'm gonna go march. And a million women showed up to march with her. We've seen people make, taking action with their wallets. You know, there's a list of things you, get, you either have to boycott or support, depending on what side you're on. But, you know, I had, I had a great excuse to go shopping at Nordstrom's for shoes this year. <laughs> There's, you know, now I got to go buy a Volvo, get a Keurig, get some Ready Whip, get stock at E-Trade. I mean, uh, you know, we could... So, you know, people, have, people are making a difference with, with their wallets. They're exerting pressure with their wallets. They are organizing. We have had impromptu protests. People were showing up at airports. Listen, guys, we're from Miami. There is nothing more horrible than having to go to MIA. And people were showing up there. No, actually, there is something more horrible than having to show up at MIA, having to go to LGA. LaGuardia is the <laughs> end of the world. And people were showing up to help. You know, when the Muslim ban happened at first, you know, lawyers were, were showing up and sitting on the floor and setting up impromptu offices to help these, uh, these folks coming in. So I, ha I think that you have seen Americans say, hell no, we are not going to take it. We're going to defend democracy. We're going to defend our rights. You've seen people start running for office. Yes. Last week in Virginia, and all over the country, it wasn't just Virginia, we saw 
We saw ceilings, glass ceilings being broken. Transgenders were elected. Blacks were elected for the first time Latinas in many places. Too. Latinas were Asian elected in Virginia. Too. So you know, we, we are seeing a sick was elected in uh, mayor in, uh, in New Jersey. So I think people are getting involved in making a difference. Well, that's great. And, and, and this leads me right into the next question. How does Senator Navarro sound? Whoa! You all want me to run against Nelson or against Marco? <laughs> That's the next question, Democrat I'll answer that. or Republican? Marco, but not Nelson. <laughs> no, listen. <laughs> I'm a Democrat. Uh, I, um, to tell you the truth, I, you know, let me make it. I'm not, I'm, I, first of all, I can't afford it, okay? My best friend is here, Lee Schrager. Look at this man. You think I can afford to be best friends with Lee Schrager if, on, a, on a government salary? I, look, g guys, I am what you see. You know, I, oh, no secrets. I am what you see. And uh, it's really hard to run for office, which is why I respect those that make the sacrifice to do it for the right reasons. You gotta be begging people for money all the damn time. It is you know, part of your life. You are in, under the public scrutiny and public eye the entire time. It's a huge sacrifice for your family and your loved ones because of the amount of travel and the amount of time that you are away. And you really, there's only so many pretty pairs of shoes that you can afford, <laughs> unless you're stealing, which I wouldn't do. But there are many ways to serve. Elected office is the most visible form, but there are other ways to serve. And for those of you who are interested, I mean, I was appointed uh, when I was 19 to the Fair Housing Commission in Baton Rouge. And then, of course, when I was 45, I was, I was appointed to the Louisiana Recovery Authority after Hurricane Katrina and her twin sister, Hurricane Rita. And at the age of 53, I was appointed by President Obama to the JW Fulbright um, Scholarship Board, so Foreign Scholarship Board. So there are many ways to serve. You don't have to just run for office. You can be appointed to office, or you can work on campaigns, but you can also serve your community in many, many ways. And I don't want her to be an elected official because then she would put pressure on me to come and join in the Senate. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that would be great. So here's, here's the dark side of all of this. You, you alluded to it a little bit. And I know, Donna, you've spoken about this. Um, the question is, what, um, what has it meant for the, what kind of danger have you experienced because you've been so outspoken? That is something I know you've spoken about as well. You know, I disagree with myself sometimes, so I, I, don't, I don't then run out the room and scream. I think when people disagree with you, they should say, look, I disagree with you. I have a fundamental different point of view. But they should not resort to a name calling and threats. Social media is wonderful. It's a great tool. I love the internet. And you all know that my ex-boss, Al Gore, invented it. <laughs> or some people claim he did. I take, I, I take exception to that. But I, the, the threats that I saw last year, they went beyond the, just the typical name calling. It was threatening. That, that pizza, Comet Pizza, that people talked about, where this guy thought there was a sex ring down in the basement. Well, that's not too far from my house. In a pizza shop that had no basement. And no basement. Uh, and people take things literally now. And they think the only way to silence you or to make you shut up is to threaten you. On Sunday, I had to go to Twitter and say, folks, stop. You might disagree with me. You may not like the book. You don't have to buy it. You can go to the library and read it. <laughs> I love public libraries. But please, do not threaten me. Do not. They had pictures of Hillary Clinton looking, laughing, and saying, yeah, she's going to commit suicide. I mean, just ugly stuff. And of course, I had the ugliness of last year with Donald Trump. When Donald Trump would tweet out, tweet out my name or call out my name, man, I didn't want to go nowhere near my house. I used to ride around and around and around. Uh, force this young woman to stay up at the bar with me eating more oysters. <laughs> we, we are Americans. We need to revive civility, especially civility in our public discourse. I talk about that on campus. I mean, if you, if you would have seen me in 2005 and 2006, 7, 8, all the way to 9, in the White House, I mentioned this in the book, I spent more time in George W. Bush White House than I did in Hillary, uh, Bill Clinton. 
Why? Because I'm a native of the South. I wanted to rebuild my home state and the Gulf Coast. And if it meant that this Democratic activist had to sit down with the Republican president who she thought lost the presidency in 2000, <laughs> I, I, you know, it was my daddy who said, go see that man, go see the president. And ladies and gentlemen, when I go home tomorrow, I'm going to see not just the new level one trauma center that we have, but also the new Veteran Administration Hospital. That's my dad who said, go see the president. And George W. Bush listened to me. So I'm proud to be an American. But, you know, um, look, there is no doubt, there is no doubt that there is political bullying. Is that for you, honey? There's a- Tell Al Sharpton I'm not available. <laughs> There's no doubt that there's political bullying uh, going on. President George W. Bush talked about it in a speech a couple of yes. weeks ago where he said that, uh, frankly, you know, he didn't name it, but he said, look, what the president is doing is setting a tone, political bullying, using the presidential pulpit for political bullying sets a tone for the rest of the country. I think that's true. I live it every day. More than that, I see it, um, this, this um, animosity and these attacks on legitimate media are really corrosive. And, you know, I, I feel bad for a lot of our friends mm -hmm. at places like CNN. And I don't yeah. mean the folks that are in front of the camera, mm -hmm. because being known gives you certain protection. I mean for the folks in the makeup room, I mean for the folks who are behind the camera, who wear the badges, who have to go drop off their children at school, and everybody knows they work for CNN. And that kind of attacks and animosity gets to them. But I also think it has led, I think it has led to great journalism in the really? last year. I, I think we've seen the worst of journalism with fake news, and I think we have seen the best of journalism by people who refuse to cower, who refuse to be bullied, who refuse to be scared, and who remember what being a journalist is, is which means sticking to facts searching out the story, revealing the truth no matter what. We're seeing it in people like Jake Tapper. We're seeing it in people like Katie Turr, like Chuck Todd. People are, there are great journalists that are emerging in this very difficult, critical moment right now in America. I agree. Well, I just want to say this was a remarkable evening, one that we will not forget. And we don't because we're hungry. Yeah. And, and, uh, and there's a great oyster thirsty. bar down uh, the yeah. block. Well, we, we're hungry and thirsty, but I want to thank the Miami Book Fair for extending this invitation. Uh, you extended the invitation before I became hot news. That's I want to say thank you for allowing <laughs> me to be here. And I also want to thank my good friend, my colleague, my sister friend, my family, Anna Navarro, the amazing Anna Navarro, for also being such a wonderful woman. Thank you yes. so much. And thank you to all of Let's you. Let's give for them both a big, big round of applause. <laughs>